my name is Doug Zeck. Uh, I'm the restoration cabinet maker here at Heritage Park. Um, I was hired 2016 to undertake the restoration of the colonist car. Myself, I'm a cabinet maker. At that point, I'd been 22 years in the industry and was really looking for a change and a challenge. And this project definitely definitely challenged me. <laughs> There's no question about it. Uh, Colonist Car at that point had been here at the park since 1964, had been used on the rail line as passenger car, had been a movie set for a documentary, um, a hot dog stand, had gone through various incarnations in its lifetime and when I was hired it had been relegated to this building as a static display and was in really, really rough shape. Uh, the colonist car itself uh, was built in 1905 uh, in Angus Yards in Montreal. Um, would have been worked on by crews of different people, welders, casters, upholsterers, painters, carpenters, cabinet makers, uh, a broad spectrum of people to work on it. I uh, really don't have any idea how long it would have taken them to build one of these back in those days. Uh, this project took over two and a half years from start to finish to do the entire restoration. And the colonist car was used in the day to bring uh, settlers to the prairies. Uh, it was basically the only way to get people to the prairies at the time. And most of those people were coming from Europe um, looking for a better life. And they came out, settled the prairies, and that was its basic purpose at the time, um, simply to bring people from Montreal and Halifax to the West. So while these, aren't, these weren't the most efficient mode of transportation by any means, they were designed to be kept in service. And... Absolutely. Everything's numbered. That was the other thing. That's one of the, re that's one of the things that we first discovered, that this car wasn't even the car that we thought it was was all of the windows, all of the doors, anything that could be removed from the car was stamped with the car number on it. So when they pulled it out to do the refurbishment, they knew which car everything belonged to and they could put it back in. Even the clerestory windows were even numbered in an order. So they were put in in a specific order when they went back in. And the car number for up until we started working on it was what, 2563? something like that, which would have placed it about 2000, or 1910, 1912 being built in the, the numbering system that CP had at the time. When I started taking this apart, I was finding 1202 on everything or uh, 2502 because they changed their numbering system at one point. Which made this car the third colonist car ever built of this style. And it was the first actual call in this car because 1200 and 1201 were uh, tourist level cars. They were much higher in fit and finish. So this was actually the first call in this car of this series ever made. And we only discovered that when we started pulling out the windows and looking at the numbers on the windows. And we're like, this should say 2568. <laughs> so we got the, the, our, the historians that we worked with on the car involved and they said, no, well, this is... Yeah, this is right. So um, Doug Phillips investigated further, and it turns out they had two of these at Aleth Yards in Ogden when they donated them to the park. Uh, one was scheduled to be burnt, and one was scheduled to be donated to the park. Well, they picked up the wrong one. So they, they actually picked up the oldest car that they had and brought it here to the park, and then they destroyed the other one. So this one was scheduled to be destroyed, to actually definitely confirm that it was 1202 was they said well underneath the header of the door in gold leaf it should say 1202 and then Mike was cleaning it out one day with the heat gun in the paint trying to peel it off and sure enough there it is gold leaf 1202 under like yeah. under like five layers of paint right. yeah, so. and there's there's some conjecture that we never got res resolution on because of the archive fire but this car may have actually been the prototypical car. There was some discussion that this might have been the one that they were 
trying stuff on and when they were building double zero and zero one but yeah because we had a mix of mahogany and, and ash right. on one end that was and it, and it wasn't like you know they they did all the exterior posts in mahogany it was like this one was mahogany this one was fur this one was ash it's like we, we got to get this built what have we got laying around the shop that we can use kind of thing so, so yeah. we never i will never know for certain if that was the case but i know that was doug phillips conjecture at the time so it's, it's an interesting little quirk in its history we'll never know for sure but it, it i like to think it's about there Probably 70% of the original wood is still on the car. Right. Yeah. So there's a, whoever built this would have to have a, a, a knowledge of different species of wood and how they perform. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the ribs for the roof were all ash. Um, ash is light, resilient, flexible, but it's also very, very strong, right? So it's something that, that would lend a lot of support to the, to the roof system itself. Um, Fur was used practically everywhere else simply because it's it's straight, um, it's strong, and it's light. And at the time, it would have been very readily available. Yeah. Everything involved in it was chosen <clears throat> for a specific purpose, right? It had its specific uh, characteristics of the wood. Um, you know, the end the end curves are are laminated uh, fur and then glued together, um, which is it wasn't done that way that's the way i did it it wasn't done initially that way this this main beam across the top um it was really rotted badly but i i can imagine it probably would have been steam bent initially right. to do the support we didn't have that capability here so i just laminated it which is pretty much the same thing it's it's about as strong yeah so. well, i know the steam bend you can't steam bend kiln dried wood like kiln dried wood does not like to bend no, you can do it, but it's it's rarely successful. Yeah, like this part would have been all air dried for or air dried material that was sitting in the yard. And sure. Yeah, it would have been 1905. I doubt they would have kiln dried much. It would have been harvested and let to dry for for years, and then milled up. And that's one of the challenges we face nowadays at land restoration is trying to find the right material, um, either because it's, it's scarce or we just don't do it that way anymore. Yeah. Well, air drying. Like who, nobody air dries wood anymore. I had the inventory for something like Aleth Yards, which is larger than a small city, would have been like they, they would have had their stock sitting there for years, but they were able to do that because they were wrapping up. Whereas to look around and say, I need 5,000 board feet of air dried ash, nobody has it. So your, um, your project is now into the years because you need to wait for the material to start. How much, how much do you think, um, in terms of design, how much? And, and design input, how much would have been an engineer versus the carpenter or the builder? Uh, I think the engineer would have been the one dictating how the car is built um, because of the fact that it's um, the system to, to tension the wall is an engineered system. It's not something that would have been made up on the side. Um, behind the siding on the outside of the wall, there is an actual truss system that's, that's built in and, and mortised into uh, the posts that go up and down. So like I said, it, it is like a bridge. There's definite engineering going along the entire length of the car that would have been something that would have been drawn out and, and designed by an engineer and then given to the carpenters to make. So it wouldn't have been something that the, I don't think they'd have been making that up on the fly. You can tighten the whole entire car up and down or loosen it for me because you wouldn't want it too tight because this does need to flex and bend. Railways at the time aren't the smooth computer <laughs> level railways that we've got today. They were probably a lot rougher. So Everything about this car, um, I always referred to it as a 75 foot long piece of furniture because at the time, Everything was jointed properly. There was proper mortise and tenon joints on everything, um, combined with uh, metal rods that bolted everything together. So that can be adjusted from underneath. You can still get at the bolts and tighten them up if, if need be. Right. Right? Like we had to replace uh, about 25 feet of one end. At some point, um, the car was derailed 
was derailed here at the park, but I don't know if that's when the damage was done. But the main sill beam that runs the full length of the car was broken. About 25 feet of one end of the, the car that had no internal support in the wall and no support from the beam from the, the queen joint back. It was like that end of the car, when you looked at it initially, sagged a good six or seven inches. It was like this. <laughs> you know, one of the more challenging things I had to do, how to cut dovetails on a corner of an angled curved piece. <laughs> so that everything went together at a specific angle. So I don't know what systems they'd had in place back in 1905 for doing it. We had a few of the original seats that are all dovetailed together. The dovetails appear to me to be machine made. They didn't look handmade. They were far too regular. I've had some kind of dovetail, automatic dovetailing device that they used in Angus Yards to do it um, because of, simply because of the regularity of them. They are, this was built in a factory. Right. They, these were rolled off of a factory line. There could have been something like that. Or the skills that these guys had could have been such that this is just the level of craftsmanship that we saw was that the, every single one is the same and every single one is perfect. Right. So it, it was it was really hard to say. Um, I didn't do any of the dovetailing by hand. I made custom router jigs to do all of the dovetailing. So it was what kind of trades did Heritage Park have um, for the restoration? The carpenters that were here helped me a little bit. Um, we had uh, myself uh, doing the lion's share of the work on it. And my, my training is basically just in cabinet making, not even in carpentry. So um, the painters that we had working on it, um, you know, Joe and his crew, this is three or four coats of varnish over top of the paint. So, and it's all done by hand with a brush. Yeah, so, the, um, that part of it was very traditionally done. Uh, they just don't do a lot of spraying here. Like, um, who else do we have? We had welders that worked on the trucks, um, taking them apart. We didn't really have much of that metal work redone. It was more just pulling them apart because the trucks themselves are wooden with metal plates around the uh, the wood interiors. We had to rebuild the wood completely. It was so incredibly badly rotted that you tapped on it with a hammer and it sounded hollow. And as soon as we took the metal plates off, it just kind of disintegrated. So, um, My name is Mike Willie. I'm the carpentry manager here at Heritage Park. I was the project manager for the colonist car, so trying to keep information flowing and find information that was very scant at the time. Originally would have been hand stained and hand varnished with gold lettering, which would have been refreshed annually as the car just wouldn't have held up otherwise. And that's actually the reason there's so few of this generation car left is that an inadvertent accident would cause a varnish fire on the exterior of the car and they would lose the cars. What type, of, what type of joinery would a carpenter have to be proficient in to put some of these assemblies together? All of the siding was tongue and groove, so may have been in ALF yards. I'm expecting they probably would have had top line machines and routers and shapers and all that type of stuff for a lot of that work. The, these large corner posts are, I think they're, yeah, they are mortised together at the tops. There's thin, thin, thin curve molding, so it would have been steam bent or wet bent to, to get the moldings to fit in properly. There's a couple sections in there that are steel that are rolled on a bias, so they're slightly conical. So you've got some sheet metal work in there. Your windows and door joinery is very typical to what you see in a home. And just constant handwork and scraping, like all of the arches and everything like that would have been roughed and then finished with rasps and hand files and scrapers and everything. The the bridge truss style system that's led into the studs on the exterior of the car, all of the gaps between those were cut and fit with individual boards 
like a like a giant jigsaw puzzle or like a, a mosaic and the studs are dadoed out so that they're fit in so the face of the stud comes out to catch the siding and then the entire skin of the car is pieces of wood that were f tightly fit into each one of them and when we were opening the car you still couldn't slide a knife between those boards they were tight and they were con connected and they were holding the level of detail that they went to on these cars and the number of pieces in the car is just staggering and all that was done by hand there was there would have been no 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 machines involved the, are you seeing this anywhere today are you seeing this level of quality going into any sort of construction today in certain circumstances, you'll see that level of precision because technology can provide that level of precision. But the, the, level of crafts, the level of craftsmanship that the design demanded of all these small fitted pieces or perfectly fit so that everything interlocks and tightens together, there's nothing that I'm aware of in modern construction that has that much dependency on so many moving parts. There's structural steel, there's trusses, there's all kinds of very inexpensive, very straightforward ways to solve the problems that they had to solve with skill and fine detail design. But it just feels like technology's take, taken a lot of that away. It's easier to just put in a big piece of steel, so they put in a big piece of steel. I think the closest you'd find to how this was built would be to high-end uh, timber framers, right? Yeah. That, that kind of you know, traditional joinery. So the, the frame is what carries all of the weight, it's not relying on, on the skin of a building to be the support system. You know, in the timber framing and stuff like that, now you'll absolutely have this level of craftsmanship and this level of design, but in a modern wood structure, they're going to go to their LVL, they're going to go to their plywood, their, their plywood they're going to mass produce fasteners, they're going to rely on all of the engineered materials that we already have because they're available like there was some plywood in this car but it was at the time still something of a novelty to have plywood what to be said about when you have to take a piece of material and then measure mark it and then cut it and fit it by hand it's there's something different about doing that than doing it with a machine or running it through a production mm -hmm. shape the car was was in service until 56 if i remember correctly like the car was seeing active use in some capacity all the way through. And that's something about Canadian Pacific is if Canadian Pacific is throwing something away, there's nothing left to fix. It's right. been adulterated and modified and twisted and changed and used and reused and shuffled. It's, they're very much the epitome of blacksmith. Until it is actually completely unusable, they kept everything. And it's a concept that struck me a little while ago, but everything is generated around driving profit and you don't drive profit by teaching someone how to build something and how to fix it. You drive profit by giving them something shiny and letting them go play. And hoping they come back for another one yeah. and another one and another yeah. one. Yeah. And you kind of loop them in that way. Yeah. Engin engineering the dependence, engineering the, the inability to solve the problem for yeah. themselves. And this is where like, this is where the art of making and, and being in the trades and yeah. being a, a builder or a maker is, is so, um, like to me, it's, it's exciting. It's an exciting thing to learn and to, to be able to do because you can take care of yourself now you become more self-sustaining it, it's mm -hmm. and this is where we want to talk about the new green movement we want to be more sustainable well how do we be more sustainable we put people to work and, and you try and use less material and reuse as much as you can and service as much as you mm -hmm. can that's what you see here and this is everything here is serviceable and there are three inch by ten inch beam that runs the entire length of the car above the, the sill beam which is eight inches by eight inches and that beam is notched around each one of the, the posts and the studs that goes down. So it's notched to fit around everything. And it was really badly dry rotted out. So we had to replace it. Well, now, as I pulled it off, I was able to actually use the maker's marks from when they originally marked to cut those slots to transfer onto the new beam because they were still there. They didn't use a pencil, they used a scribe. Scribe, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was scribed into the wood in, on like every, basically every 12 inches for 75 feet was scribed. And I was able to use those actual marks to recreate the new one with a router and then stand it up and it just slid on perfectly.
So it was like I was able to use their original. I didn't have to pull a measuring tape out. I just transferred each mark across. Oh, that was cool, hey? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and that's one of the, the coolest things about doing this was the evidence of their hand in the building of the car was, was everywhere. Even to down to the point where you pull one piece of siding off and there's all the names of the guys written in pencil. Oh, yeah. Back of the yeah. Sign. yeah. yeah. So yeah. They, they'd signed maybe the last piece that went on. Yeah. yeah. Between all of the interior finishing and the exterior structure were strips of linen tacked in between them so that as the car moved, the interior wood wouldn't squeak as it rubbed oh, yeah. on the exterior yeah. wood. So the linen was in place to keep the car quiet. Right? So and we found that everywhere inside. Hmm. So it was like there was so many things that we uh, that you, you don't even think about. But the fact that because it's a wooden car, everything is going to be moving and twisting and changing and having that little bit of friction between them would have driven you nuts as it went down the, the, the road. <laughs> just squeak, 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 squeak. squeak. And, and so many of those little details too weren't in any of the, doc the limited documentation that was available to us. So you started pulling off pieces and recognizing a pattern and taking the time to stop and go, why would they this is probably why they did that. And so much of this car was by discovery that, oh, that's why they did that, or that's how they did that. And that's, that's one of those things you never see it coming on a project like this project or the, the other cars we've done around here too, kind of looking over your shoulder and seeing why you did something that way or why it was done that way. And you start to so. develop a sort of very intimate connection of your past. Mm -hmm. as you, yeah. Yeah. The finished product is one thing and it's beautiful, no question, and it's quite something to look at. But the whole process of doing it is, that, I mean, that's a whole, that's something you want to capture in itself and try and explore. Because mm -hmm. for this, this, not the first year that we worked on it, but the second two summers, um, the roundhouse was open for people to go through and actually observe us working on, okay. on the rail car as we were doing it. The first, the first year we needed the entire roundhouse because we, We'd lifted the, the rail car up, put it on stands, and pushed the trucks out onto another set of trucks so they could be redone and stuff. We didn't have room, but once we get the trucks back underneath it, we opened up the, the one side of the roundhouse so they could walk past and actually see us working on it and ask questions. And, and, and did you did you find that there was a lot of interest <coughs> from the general public? In there was so much interest. People would, were coming in because they heard of this, because we'd had a fair amount of media coverage. We'd had newspaper and, and news coverage on it. Um, we actually had, I was there one day when two elderly guys came up and started asking me about it um, because they'd heard about it and they lived in Irvine, California, and they have a railway museum there. And they heard about this through, I don't know, somehow, and they actually made the trip here to, uh, to come and actually look at the car as I was working on it. So I gave them a, a personal inside tour of it <laughs> that day. Not, the, not, not many people got that, but, but these guys did. But they actually came that far. On it, and someone comes walking through, oh, my grandpa talked about, and there, was, there were a few of those moments while we were working in the Roundhouse too that were fun where guests were tying their history to this car or to cars like it. And it made the whole project Quite unique. That was a lot of fun.